thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcus. <laughs> thank you also, Eric and Andrea, for, for everything as well. And thank you to, really, to everybody who's, you know, who's mentioned here and to everyone for, for coming. Um, I'm going to now in, uh, introduce the, our three panelists. Um, just a little, a little disclaimer beforehand. <laughs> uh, uh, I actually uh, don't know them extremely well. So uh, what I'm going to say is most, most of what I'm going to say about them you can find uh, you know, in, in the program booklet or <laughs> online somewhere. <laughs> uh, so to uh, Jimba Langrila, uh, who has a Geshe Larampa, uh, Geshe Larampa from Kandil Shadze, uh, holds a BA honors in philosophy and a PhD in religious studies from Cambridge University. He is an uh, adjunct professor at McGill University, uh, which is in my own hometown of Montreal. Uh, he's associated with Princeton University's Center for Compassion and Altruism Research. Stanford. Uh, Stan Stanford. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and my late, late Mind and Life Institute as well. Um, uh, he is uh, founder and president of the Institute of Tibetan Classics and general editor for the Library of Tibetan Classics. He is highly respected and revered as a scholar, uh, is extremely well published, uh, uh, both in English and in Tibetan, uh, and has been, uh, for many uh, non-Tibetan speakers, uh, the voice uh, <laughs> that has allowed many to comprehend and access uh, the, the teachings of His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, uh, for Buddhists and non-Buddhists alike uh, since 1985. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm doing this in order of speaking, <laughs> in order in which they're going, the panelists are going to speak. So uh, Roger Jackson uh, is the second, uh, will be speaking next. Um, PhD in 1983 from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, sitting under the, uh, unfortunately, recently uh, deceased Geshe Tundrup Zopa, uh, currently professor of Asian studies and religion at Carleton College in Minnesota, um, was longtime editor for, uh, for JIAB, so Journal of International Association for Buddhist Studies, and currently editor for the Indian, Indian International Journal of Buddhist Studies. Uh, and his research has dealt with philosophy, ritual, meditative practices, and poetry, to name but a few. And he is currently completing an anthology of Gelukpa Mahamudra texts, from what I understand. Uh, so welcome, Roger. Uh, Sarah Harding, who I only met yesterday for the first time, uh, began practicing Buddhism in 1974 and completed the first, uh, first ever three-year retreat in the West in 1980. Uh, she's been teaching, uh, as most of you know already, teaching at Naropa University since 1992. Her work includes translations of Tibetan practice, commentaries, and works by figures such as Jamun Kontro Rinpoche, uh, Jamun Kontro Patru Rinpoche, Bema Lingpa, and uh, she is the author of Nigo Lady of Illusion and Machik's Complete Explanation, clarifying, it, clarifying the meaning of Chu. Though she says she is a counterfeit scholar, <laughs> <laughs> She is also a bona fide practitioner <laughs> and a highly skilled translator and teacher who combines both Buddhist practice and scholarly rigor in her work. And she also has a great sense of humor, which you just saw by the fact that she actually laughed at that. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I made a joke. Uh, and she'll probably, I'll probably get in trouble for saying stuff like this uh, later on. Um, anyway, welcome, sir. <laughs> so I am going to turn over uh, <coughs> The discussion to uh, to the Jimba. Okay, please. Thank you. Um, it's really uh, a great pleasure for me personally to be part of this large gathering of people, uh, all of us uh, who share a deep affection and uh, also uh, a profound connection with the Tibetan tradition in our lives, both professional and personal. So to be part of this group uh, as a Tibetan is both humbling as well as also I feel a sense of gratitude to all of you who have chosen and decided that this tradition is really worth paying your attention and time and dedication. So thank you. Um, what I thought I would do in my uh, short presentation is to really uh, 
kind of, you know, uh, say a few words about what the Tibetans themselves have thought about, what translation is all about. Um, as you all know, uh, Tibetan tradition, which is really the source tradition in this particular conversation, is essentially a, a product of translation. Um, and that's uh, some one of the unique characteristics of the Tibetan tradition. And it makes it very explicit, because to the point when authority is invoked, uh, you know, lineage, the Indian lineage, matters a lot. So it is a self-consciously uh, translation culture. Uh, it's a product of translation. So I felt that uh, if, you know, we can have a little glimpse into what the Tibetans themselves thought about what translation is all about, maybe this will set a larger background in which this conversation we're going to have might have a different kind of flavor. So um, let me begin by... Um, you know, with a quote, my one of my best, one of my favorite quote when it comes to translation. This is from Ralph Waldo Emerson: "What is best in any book is translatable, any real insight or human sentiment." And those all of us who have been involved in translation in one way or another, we operate from the premise that we actually believe in this. You know, otherwise, why bother? Uh, we do believe, now it may be a varying degrees of what is it that is being brought across, but we do believe that when our act of translation does matter, and we are the medium through which the great masters of the past will speak to the modern reader. And that's a fundamental, that's a basic premise that we operate from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to three sources from the Tibetan tradition, very briefly, since I have only 10 minutes. One is Dajru uh, Pambunyiba, the bilingual lexicon that was created right at the beginning of 9th century when the language was reformed and standardized. Um, the second is uh, a reference to Ngoklon Zewa Londem Sharap, around the end of 11th century, beginning of 12th century, whose influence in the way in which the Tibetan tradition comes to engage with the classical Indian works, particularly the, those of philosophical nature, really had a lasting influence. So I'm going to talk a little bit about him. And third, finally, I will to say a few words about what Sakya Pandita, who, one of my most favorite authors among the, among the Tibetan writers, um, thought about uh, uh, translation, because Sakya Pandita was a great linguist and a grammarian and Sanskritist. Uh, in his own right, and what he thought about translation uh, is quite interesting. So, what I'm, so those are the three things that I will. Um, so the first one is, you know, this is, you know, the Dajo Pampani was very interesting. It was compiled together um, at a meeting of, um, you know, most of the important Tibetan translators of that time, along with the great Indian masters who were present, and then they sat down and wrote this. It down, and in one of the opening statements, there is this statement that says, with respect to the approach to translating the sublime dharma, undertake this in a way that does not violate the meaning, the emphasis is mine, um, and at the same time is appealing to the sensibilities of the Tibetan language. So this morning we were really ex exposed to a wonderful presentation from David Bellows, and you can see echoes of that tension in David's presentation. Now, more specifically, Dajo Pampo goes on to then actually gives you instructions how to do this. And one of the it says is that when it comes to word orders and syntax, Tibetan should be the priority. Unless the particular word syntax of a text, like a mantra, has a special meaning, the word order and syntax should be really the Tibetan, not Sanskrit. Um, second, if the text is verse, keep the verse structure. I think that, and this is something that I've insisted in my own Library of Tibetan Classics series. Uh, I have, you know, appealed to all the translators, if the source is in verse, please retain it in verse. Then another thing that the Raju Pampanjiva says is that the original terms that has multiple meanings should not be really reduced into one translation. In those situations, keep the original terms, like an example given is Gautama and Kaushika. So in the sutras, they were left untranslated. Um, and then names of places, animals, and flora, where by creating neo neologisms, like new words, it will create more confusion because the readers will have simply no framework to understand that neologism. In that case, it's better to keep the original. 
And in some cases, you might need to add flour or something, like metal, some metal zambaka or something. Add something, but keep the original. And then it has a lot of uh, things to say about how to handle the Sanskrit grammatical particles, which may not completely match the Tibetan language structure. So those are some of the specific items I listed from uh, Dajo Pampunyiba. So I'm going to now run forth. Next is Ngolondin Sharab. Ngolondin Sharab is probably, one could say arguably, the founder of Tibetan scholasticism, scholastic tradition. Um, he uh, did a lot of translations, but where he really excelled and dedicated is the translations of Brahmana texts, epistemology and logic, and so-called Maitreya collection of texts. Those were the two areas where Ngolandin Sharab was really well known, most known for. And he did not, I mean, to my knowledge, make any specific comments about the actual theory and practice of translation. And in his own translation, he was much more straightforward. He never really you know, fiddled with the, you know, changing the structure of the text. But what he was known for is creating indigenous study aids that can help the Tibetan reader to read. So summary points is he wrote, and later this is what em evolved into the Sache system. So, uh, and all of you are familiar with this. I'm not going to go into this. Third is Sache Pandita. Sache Pandita was very interested in, um, you know, trying to understand why some Tibetan translations don't read well, and it's difficult to understand, and why some do. And he's, you know, he was more interested in trying to find out why some of the translators failed is because they were not exposed well enough to the cultural context of the Sanskrit texts. So this is what Bellus was talking, Professor Bellus was talking about, that you need to have a lot more to understand the text. So uh, he talked about the idiosyncratic approach to translation, you know, using vernaculars, misunderstanding the meaning of synonyms, you know, chopping the Sanskrit word in the wrong way, all of this. And then, for example, he gives an example of how Yang Jema should have been Sojung mm. <laughs> Hamu and not, you know, Yang Jema. So, so these are, and then he talked about how sometimes if you don't understand this well, then there is a danger of back reading into the Tibetan an etymology which does not exist in the original, like Yishi, Ye does not exist in the Sanskrit. <coughs> so if you try to have a gloss, it doesn't work. Mm. So to conclude, what I see uh, emerging in these Tibetan scholars' engagement is kind of a, a tension felt between two poles you know, that every translator faces. One is the pole of being faithful to the source. So that emphasizes the demands of rigor and literal approach and all the rest. At the same time, there is the other pole, which is the making the text accessible to the reader. So, you know, like George Bellus was talking about being kind to the reader. That requires fluidity and more creative appropriation. And it's a tension. And I don't think the tension is avoidable. <coughs> then there is uh, what I would call three conflicting allegiances. You have an allegiance to the reader, but you have allegiance to the cultural context of the text in order to make it really speak. And then you have the allegiance to yourself. You, you can never step out of your own shadow. In the end, you know, professor, as Professor Bellos pointed out, that you have to take responsibility for creating the meaning of the text you produce. No translator can avoid that. So to conclude, what I would like to have pointed out is that if you look at even this very brief example of how the Tibetans have thought about translation, it is quite clear that at least those Tibetans who have given some critical reflection, you know, understood translation to be a complex enterprise, complex, creative, interpretive. I don't think any of these masters assume translation to be a kind of a naive, simple approach where, you know, your job is to produce a carbon copy of what was there in the original, like such so-called pure translation. Of course, that leaves the larger question. In that case, how, how do we understand what is that it, you know, that we bring from one language to another, and how does translation play a role in bringing that across to the another language? And that is the larger topic of our conversation, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, learning more about this as we as our conversation grows thank you thank you thank you very much uh, okay am i am i audible yes
to myself anyway. Um, I was in uh, correspondence with a friend of mine uh, a few weeks ago asking him if he was going to be coming to the conference and his reply was, I thought about it, but I actually prefer translating to talking about translation. <laughs> uh, I, I take his point on a certain level, but I'm actually delighted to be here and glad that this meeting is, is happening. I'm going to make a, a, a few very general comments about translation and then home, home in on some particular issues that seem to me we face as translators of Tibetan and exemplify that by talking about three different translation projects I've been involved in over the course of 30 odd, 40 years now almost. Um, it's, it's easy in some ways if, if you're a translator and you think about uh, the difficulty of it, what T.S. Eliot calls the intolerable wrestling with words and meanings to despair of the whole project uh, to, to feel that, as we know from the title of, uh, of a panel this afternoon, you know, trad, uh, traditor, traditore, traditore, right? This is the, the, the kind of cliche about, about translation, that we're always betraying the original. Um, and yet, I've got to say that in, in my many years now as a scholar, um, doing all sorts of scholarly work from kind of popular pieces to philosophical things to anything in between. I, I, I think I seldom feel the pleasure, the, the sheer pleasure uh, that I do in anything else as when I translate. Um, and again, this is, this is recognizing the incredible difficulty of it, the fact that, that you, you're, you're, you're not quite getting it, will never quite get it. It's, 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 a, it's an impossible process. I, I, I often think of a line from a, a Samuel Beckett play, uh, I think it's Olé Beaujour. Um, I can't go on, I must go on, I can't go on, I must go on. And that's, I sometimes feel like my career as a translator has, has been a, a bit like that. Um, there are, you do get these serendipitous moments where, you know, suddenly it all seems to, to, to flow together. You find the right word. Um, there's a Gay and Wilson cartoon, which if I thought ahead I would have had up here, but that would have been my only visual, but I don't have it with me, that I have on my office door, which is uh, from quite some years ago, an old scholar kind of books everywhere, sitting at his, his desk, bespectacled, bespectacled, looking up, and he says, you know, for a minute there, it all almost made sense. <laughs> That's... That's, that's the situation I, I feel we're in, in in many respects. But I, I want to actually echo something that was said this morning. Uh, Jinpa raised it in, in his question, and I was going to make this observation as well, that um, translation may be an impossibility on, on a certain level, um, yet it, it, is, it is a necessity because the way I would put this is we are translated beings. Um, we, it's, it's not just that translation is something that occurs between you know, source culture and target culture, but it's something that happens all the time within cultures, uh, within and between different realms of discourses, and even within our own minds, neurons uh, trying to communicate with the rest of the body. Um, it's, we, we, translation is something we always do, and so why not do it? Um, the, the, <laughs> the, the, particular, the particular points that I, I want to um, uh, get to in a, in a slightly more specific, it seems to me, and this, this also comes off of uh, Jinpa's uh, uh, point about the, the Tibetan recognition of the complexity of all of this, that um, you, we, when we're undertaking translation, there's a number of different considerations we, we have to keep in mind. This, this came up in the, the talk this morning as well. Um, you know, in, in our particular case, who, who is our audience? Um, is, it, is it the general public? Is it Buddhist practitioners? Is it academics? I, I think we wrestle with these questions often, uh, regardless of the particular context from which we're doing a translation. What is our process? Um, is it solitary? I mean, there's been a lot of jokes about solitary translators, and yet many of these solitary translators are, as we know, involved in committees, in larger projects. So solitariness is, is a bit of an illusion. Is it consultative? That is, it's a project of ours for which we are consulting with others? Or is it collaborative in, in whatever, whatever that term may mean? 
Um, the, the, old, the question, I would put it this way because I probably enjoy translating poetry more than anything else, how much poetic license are we allowed in translation? How literal or figurative um, must our translation be? Certainly in translating from Tibetan to English, and I think this is echoed in some of the things that, that Jinpa has mentioned. Um, we want to avoid, there's, there's a sort of Scylla and a Charybdis here, or we might say two extremes to be more Buddhistic about it. Um, on the one hand, we want to avoid what uh, Paul Griffiths famously called Buddhist hybrid English, um, or what my, one of my uh, teachers called Tiblish, um, which, is, which is in a way a, a, a form of, of translation that doesn't go far enough in meeting the target culture and language where it is. The other extreme then is, is what the Chinese, and my pronunciation will be wrong, so forgive me, but the Chinese would call gui yi, uh, the matching concepts idea where you simply plug in something from your culture and that substitutes for and gives you then the illusion that you understand a term that is, is quite foreign. Um, in, in terms of, uh, even more specifically, as translators of Tibetan, uh, I think there's a, a number of questions we have to face and, and try to decide. You know, this point about decision is an important one. Um, uh, three of them jump out at me. Given how foundational Indian Buddhism is for Tibetan Buddhism, what's our relation and responsibility to original Indic sources? Uh, this may be somewhat less of a problem if we're, only, we're dealing with strictly Tibetan texts, but so many Tibetan texts are directly or indirectly related to Indic originals that this, this is something we, we need to, to deal with. Um, and it, it, it touches then, of course, on the whole question of competence in Sanskrit or other Indic languages. Uh, a second is what is our relation and responsibility to Tibetans who may be our consultants or collaborators on projects? Um, I, I think none of us here who's done translation has not been involved with Tibetans at one level or another of our work, and yet th there can be tensions, as we, as we all understand. Uh, thirdly, what is our relation and responsibility to contemporary academic practices and standards, um, as, as, as defined in, let's call it the world of Buddhist studies, for, for want of a better term. Um, so I'm going to kind of wrap up by just very briefly mentioning the ways in which some of these problems have been played out in, as I said, three different projects I've done or been involved with over the years. The first is the work that essentially came out of my dissertation and really my first book, uh, Is Enlightenment Possible? It's got a long subtitle, but it's basically a, a translation and fairly extensive discussion of Gautzapje's Gelukpa commentary on the second chapter of Dharmakirti's Pramanabhartika, which is sort of, for me, and I think for many people, the locus classicus for a Buddhist philosophy of religion. Um, my audience for this, since it was you know, kind of out of my dissertation, was, was largely an academic one. I did try to write an introduction that was fairly accessible. I don't know if I succeeded or not, but it was, it was an academic audience I was targeting mostly. The process in this case was consultative in that I worked with Geshe Zopa um, as well as with uh, Geshe Namgyal Wangchen when I was over in Sarnath, um, particularly on Yeltsop's commentary, though there was much there in my footnotes and my introduction that weren't involved there. My degree of poetic license was quite low. <laughs> it was, I was, I was trying, uh, I, I thought of it as fidelity, but probably uh, people who read the translation will think of it as being in Tiblish. Um, and the issues, uh, the issues that, that uh, this is I think the more interesting part, the issues that I faced, uh, there were two in particular that came up. Uh, one of them was in relation to my Tibetan consultants, in particular to Geshe Zopa, who was my advisor. Um, he was perfectly happy with the translation. He was not, to be honest, perfectly happy with all the philosophical observations I made in either my introduction or the footnotes, because I was, to be honest, slightly more skeptical about the probative value of Dharmakirti's arguments for past and future lives and so forth than he was. So, you know, this is a... Uh, this was a point. <laughs> uh, the, the other point, and this came up after the book was published, had to do with the degree, this was, I, I was criticized in a review by Elie Franco for not being sufficiently indological in my approach to Dharmakirti. Um, I tried to make it very clear in, in my introduction, I'm reading this through 
you know, Gautzop's commentary that I'm not pretending to unearth the, the Sanskrit original of Dharmakirti, but it was, you know, it was a, a criticism that was made and it certainly gave me pause and I think it's, it's the kind of criticism that should give us pause in any case. Second project I'll, I'll talk quickly about is, is Tantric Treasures, a very, a very different uh, kettle of fish in your ear, um, which uh, is, is, as a, a couple of you may know, a, a translation of, of uh, fundamentally from the Apabrangsha, but with uh, Tibetan where necessary, of the Doha Koshas of Tilopa, Kanha, and uh, Saraha. And here the audience was very different. I had, I had in mind a, a book that might be accessible and useful in the undergraduate classroom in the US. Um, the process was as close to solitary as I think I've ever had in a, in a scholarly project. I, um, of course, I've, I've depended in many ways on conversations and texts and so forth. Uh, but uh, I, you know, it was, it was really me. <laughs> Uh, doing most of this work. The, my degree of poetic license was considerable in this. Um, and the issues that I faced were, again, the, the question of, of relation to Indic originals, uh, wrestling with Apabrangsha, something that is not commonly taught even in graduate programs was, was difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, trying, and, and trying, to, trying to deal with, with all the issues connected with that. And, and for me, of course, the, the key question was the whole matter of how much liberty I could or should take in, in my poetic, quasi-poetic translations of these Indic originals. And I, I chose deliberately to take quite a bit of liberty, at least in the way I organized it. I hope, uh, I, I felt that I still was being reasonably faithful uh, to what was there in the original text. Finally, a uh, project on which I worked with, uh, with uh, Jinpa and many other people as well, the Crystal Mirror of uh, Philosophical Systems, a translation of the great early 19th century um, uh, Tukem Drumta. Uh, here, the, uh, the audience was some, something like a mix of practitioners and scholars, perhaps. We certainly wanted to make it very scholarly, but we wanted to make it uh, accessible to a, a, a larger audience than just the academic community. The process was thoroughly collaborative. Uh, there were five or six of us who were intimately involved in it. Geshe Zopo was really the overseer of the project. I was the editor for the volume. Um, I think our degree of poetic license was was medium, <laughs> um, and, that, and and the fact that it, the fact that it actually reads as fairly well as some people have told me they think it reads um, is largely due to good editing by David Kittlestrom. Um, he's uh, he's a wonder. <laughs> Um, the issues here were unification of styles, and I think this, any collaborative project faces this as a real difficulty when different people are doing different sections, how you bring all those together. And the, an interesting question, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pretty much end with this because I, I know I've gone over by a, a few minutes here, is an interesting question that, that came up for people who were, who, who were consulted about the volume at various stages was the whole question of Toucan's authorial bias. When Geshe Zopa met with the previous Dujon Rinpoche many years ago um, in Nepal, uh, Rinpoche was not pleased with the way that, that Toucan presented the Nyingma tradition. And I, uh, when, when I think when we ran this by Matthew Kapstein for his vetting early on, I think he, he felt a, a little bit the same way as well. And much later in the process, um, the, uh, it, was, it was sent to somebody expert in Sakya tradition who, again, didn't, didn't object so much to the translation or the language, but to, to Toucan's attitude. So this, this shows shows that there, there may be some lingering issues even among Western scholars about some of the, the divides that Tibetans have um, been uh, subject to over the years. Um, again, I would just, uh, final words, I, I, would, I would agree with what everybody here already knows that the translation is an exceedingly complex process. Um, and, and a difficult one, but I, I think that if we, if we are self-conscious about issues like audience, our, our method of approach, the degree of liberty we feel we can or ought to take, and, and the, these, these somewhat fraught questions about our relation to Indic originals and perhaps especially the Tibetans with whom we work and without whom in many cases we could not do our work, that, that we can at least edge towards making translation something useful. Okay.
Thank you, Roger. Okay. Hi. <laughs> it's a really honor to be here and also kind of terrifying. Um, with friends and colleagues and, you know, quite a few rock stars, you know who you are. Uh, <laughs> I want to um, also re reiterate what we've been talking about um, in this, you know, variable ocean of translators, that it's so wonderful to come together from these kind of two sides, and not just as groups, uh, but as individuals, because I think uh, practitioners are becoming scholars, scholars are becoming practitioners, and you know, it's becoming much more sort of holistic individually as well as a group. Um, from my side, you know, I'm coming from totally the practice side originally, and as uh, I pointed out, I'm just you know kind of faking my way through scholarship. But um, um, after you know just doing it, and you know, I wanted to tell you, you know, since Professor Bellows t said why he became a translator, that I didn't actually plan to be a translator, but I started learning. Tibetan because I found translators so annoying. <laughs> Isn't it ironic? <laughs> so um, uh, I feel like um, you know there's these, this opportunity that we have, and this this quote that I, I got from um, Bhikkhu Bodhi has been up there this whole time. So you probably already read it. So I'm not going to read it uh, out loud, but. I feel like Bhikkhu Bodhi has become the sort of Rumi of Buddhism. You know, he's so quotable and so articulate, <laughs> and I can't do that well. Um, but there is this, uh, a lot like the responsibility in the end of, um, you know, what what we are trying to do, no matter how hard it is. Um, so starting to think about theory after just so many years of just doing it without thinking about theory has been very illuminating and very interesting. But I want to get off my chest right off the bat that you know my own theories and other people's theories, my translations do not live up to them. And um, they seem to be made sort of for ideal situations of, you know, uh, you know, as if we had time, as if we had weeks and weeks and weeks to find the perfect you know, translation for one line, you know, as if we had qualified informants around, you know, like, Where's my pandita? I want my pandita <laughs> that I work with that lives in the basement that I can, um, <laughs> you know, I can consult instead of, you know, running, running around after llamas like musk deer, you know, trying to get a few clarifications. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, so it, it, we, I don't need to repeat all the difficulties. Um, but something is kind of um, coming together. So I wanted to uh, talk about um, intention. And Janet just told me this morning that's very old fashioned. But I think uh, <laughs> at 63, I'm entitled to be old, you know, if not, if not so fashioned. But, um, <laughs> and so as a nod towards modernity, I'm going to show a, a YouTube video. Go ahead. Please forgive the language. Cover your ears if you're worried. I think I'm going to show a video. And think about intentionality while you watch. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Now, before I begin, I just want to say that I know a lot of people out there seem to think that uh, I don't get angry. That's just not true. I get angry a lot. Uh, it's just that the way I express passion is different from most. So, just so there's no more confusion, we've hired Luther here to be my anger translator. Luther? Hi. First off, concerning the recent developments in the Middle Eastern region, uh, I just want to reiterate our unflinching support for all people and their right to a democratic process. Hey, all y'all dictators out there, keep messing around and see what happens. Just see what happens. Watch! Also, to the governments of Iran and North Korea, uh, we once again urge you to discontinue your uranium enrichment program. Hey, my move, Kim Jong, I think I already told both y'all, 86 your shit bitches, I'm gonna come over there and do it for y'all. Please test me and see what happens. On the domestic front, uh, I just wanna say to my critics, I hear your voices, 
and I'm aware of your concerns. So maybe if you can chill the hell out for like a second, then maybe I can focus on some shit, you know? That goes for everybody. Uh, including members of the Tea Party. Oh, don't even get me started on these motherfuckers right here. <laughs> <laughs> that we will be looking for new compromises with the GOP in the months ahead. And you know these motherfuckers gonna say no before I even suggest some shit. Now, I know a lot of folks say that I haven't done a good job at communicating my accomplishments to the public. Because y'all motherfuckers don't listen. Uh, uh, since being in office, We've created three million new jobs. Three million new jobs. We ended the war in Iraq. End the war, y'all. We ended a war. Remember, remember that? Not These anymore. achievements should serve as a reminder that I am on your side. I am a Muslim. And that my intentions as your president are coming from the right place. They're coming from Hawaii, which is where I'm from, which is in the United States of America, y'all. OK? This is ridiculous. I have a birth certificate. I have a birth certificate. I have a hot, bigoted, dieted, lot of same on the side of Microsoft birth certificate, you dumbass crackers. OK. So <laughs> Rope it in. Rope it in. You're down your back with the dam. In conclusion, uh, last night, uh, I had a conversation with Michelle. I said, and bitch. Nope, I did not say that. I did not say that. Um, so, <laughs> try and draw back the energy from there. Which one is more true? Yeah, which one is more true? You know, the real feelings that are going on, such as Luther is expressing, or the intention that President Obama has being diplomatic, uh, I think we could say that that's his intention, is not to be exposing truth, actually, but to leave it to be interpreted, to leave it as thinly veiled threats, maybe, um, and still be sort of unaccountable for saying them. And so it almost invites interpretation, uh, whereas Luther, you know, there's nothing more to say. It's very clear. It's the best communication. The communication is clear. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting in thinking about intention. Um, another, quickly, another example that might be a little more appropriate is um, my friend Peter Roberts translating the uh, uh, Samadhi Raja Sutra, which is, you may know, is often cited as the source of the Kargyu teachings, especially of Mahamudra. And there being nothing, I hear, about Mahamudra in it whatsoever. And then in uh, Trangu Rinpoche acknowledging that said, um, well, it's because, you know, we really should relate to the intention behind the sutra. So the question is, that who gets to decide what the intention behind the sutra is? And I feel like we're the, there's many people all along the way, starting with Buddha word, you know, and even that, I mean, Magadhi and, you know, what, and, you know, who, that's already interpreted. And all the way along the line is this long, long line of translators. And we're just like the end. You know, we're at the end. And then, then there may be more. It's not the final end game, because then you, as a translator, might be translated into another language. And then anything can happen out of control, as you know. Um, so you know, that, it, it's unavoidable. You know, as Stephen Jim said, it's unavoidable that you have to make these decisions at some point. And we have this formulaic Tibetan thing, and, and, and I translate primarily from, you know, Tibetan source text, not Sanskrit, because I don't know it. And, um, you know, where it says, you know, the intention is said right at the beginning. You know, first it says, you know, I know nothing, you know, all humble, I know nothing, you know, I'm Jon Snow, I know nothing. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, and then, oh, I'm just doing this to clarify for my own good. And then finally, but in case anybody is benefited for all sentient beings, may it be a benefit. And I find it interesting that we kind of automatically dismiss the first two without question. We dismiss that he, the person, the author, knows nothing and that he's just doing it for himself. And then we believe on surface you know, just face value that is for the benefit of all beings. And, that, and then that we have to take that as the intention. There's really no choice. I mean, you can analyze um, even such as uh, uh, um, um, Professor Quintman's talk a couple of days ago in Boulder, analyzing um, Sangyon Heruka's motivations that are kind of very interesting and um, nuanced. You know, it's not quite that simple. And it, we can assume that it never is. And yet, we don't know. And so we have to basically go on that intention, but that leaves the horrible dangling question of, of uh, you know,
well, if we're going to follow the intention, and, and maybe I'll take your challenge of what is the it that we are translating and um, say that it's that intention, but you still are left with, well, what is beneficial? And is what was beneficial then beneficial now? And, you know, if we're going to put it in English or French, I think I, I have to emphasize French. France took quite a beating this morning. <laughs> <laughs> if we put it into French um, or English, you know, vernacular, well, the Tibetan wasn't in vernacular in most cases. Very rarely is it in Tibetan vernacular. So then that's another interpretation translation, first of all. And then we have to think, um, is it helpful? And I mean, I've been sort of typecast as you know, translator of Chirut, and I think I'm on like my 30th text of Chirut, and I just want to use that as an extreme example. How is that put into an accessible language to people who, you know, chopping up the body, giving it to, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's imp practically impossible. I mean, people have demythologized it, psychologized it, done every possible kind of thing to it, but I don't feel like that's the translator's, I don't feel like that's my job, that's somebody else's job who um, fancy themselves as teachers and should me read my translations. <laughs> but um, I, to put those kind of ideas back onto the intention of, a, of an author, I, th I think would be too far, it would be too much, it would actually be untrue. You know, to say, well, demons don't really exist, so you know, just forget it, you guys. It, that's not in there. And so, anyway, I thought that was an interesting way to think about it um, in terms of extreme case. I think that's probably pretty extreme. But there's still hope, I think, uh, that something useful can happen. And I'd like to end with uh, this. No, next one. Um, by T.S. Eliot, again, since we were on a T.S. Eliot. Translation is valuable by a double power of fertilizing a literature by importing new elements, which may be assimilated, and by restoring the essentials, which have been forgotten in traditional literary method. There occurs in the process a happy fusion between the spirit of the original and the mind of the translator. The result is not exoticism, but rejuvenation. So that's sort of hopeful. I'm not sure, but you know, I think it, it, it could be very a positive product. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you proved my point of the, uh, uh, of uh, your uh, sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> I had Kay and Peel do that. <laughs> yes, but you did bring it in. <laughs> Uh, so I'm actually going to open it up for the discussion right away. Um, so if, if uh, any of you have any comments, questions to each other. Well, I guess I've got a question for Jinpa uh, coming out of, you know, this fascinating but concise presentation. Was you, the, the figures you were dealing with were essentially from the, uh, from the Chidar? Yes. Period, right? Well, the Daju Pambunyiba is another, though. Sorry? Daju Pambunyiba is another. The first one is another. Yeah. He's, he's in the, he's in the, another. The, the bilingual lexicon. That's yeah. from another. Yeah, period. okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so there was reflection on it going on oh, yeah, yeah. over the course of many centuries, yeah. anyway. Uh, my main question, though, was uh, do, is the reflection on this once the, 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 this great process of translation has ended? Um, do, do people talk about this in the 18th, 19th centuries? Um, well, not specifically on translation per se, but in some of the authors, more critically minded authors' writings, you do see, you know, quite often um, kind of musings on a particular terminology. And, um, you know, for example, like Tsongkhapa would quite often uh, compare different translations and would, for example, in his um, commentary on uh, um, entering the middle way, you know, although the standard translation is that of Patsap, but he often chooses Naktolotsawa's translation over Patsap. So you do get, uh, you know, and then you see the same kind of approach in um, subsequent writers, mm -hmm. but there is no specific kind of discussion of translation per se, because Sapin's treatment of that in Kinju was quite extensive. Mm -hmm. 
and it was really seen as kind of the standard, uh, standard kind of understanding. So, I, 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 you know, this, this I suggestion that uh, this it, you know, what is that it that we're bringing across, um, maybe we can identify that as an intention of the author. Um, I'm not quite sure, because that puts a huge amount of responsibility on the, re on the translator. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes uh, authors' intention are probably not that clear to themselves. So in, in those kind of situations, you know, you do have a text in front of you. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there is a text in front of you does presuppose the possibility of being able to translate it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so how, I don't know if, I mean, I think intention is part of it, but I think there is probably more to intention, because the intention mm -hmm. is very individual, mm -hmm. whereas that, from my point of view, uh, you know, I mean, I, although I don't go to this, you know, extreme of French critical theory, which argues that once the author has written the text, author has no priority of claim over mm. the meaning of what he has written, because it's a social kind of, you know, uh, product, although I don't, I wouldn't go that far, but I, don't, I do think they have a point, because, you know, intention is individual, but mm -hmm. the product is a text that already presupposes a certain background yeah. and participates in a shared kind of language and con concepts. So I'm wondering what is that other thing that we might need to add on to oh, intention. Yeah. So I don't know if you... Well, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I, you know, there is... His, I don't agree that... I don't, you know, some, some colleagues have said, you know, well, the Dharma teachings are sort of unmoored in historical time, and yes. I don't buy no, that no. at all. They come out of time and place sure. very sure. clearly. Um, and intention is the same. We sure. don't know what, sure. what's actually going sure. on. But I feel like that's, that's all we have is that little statement. Like we have to assume it in yes. a way. Yes. Um, we could analyze, well, maybe they were trying to impress somebody or maybe their jindak was, sure. you know, thing. Sure. Or all kinds of motivations, <laughs> you know. They were arguing because yeah. Saika Pandita insulted them <laughs> or whatever. Um, all, of course, all of that is there. But I just, I just think it's quite hard to train. I mean, it, that seems like more like, you know, japture, like, like you would want to set that context. But in the actual translation, in a way, I feel like I have to just trust a little bit because I don't know. Sure, sure. Yeah. You know? sure. So that intention um, you know, has to be this, um, as, as Professor Bella said, the kindness to the reader. It has to sure. be, uh, without necessarily being like vernacular or sure. idiomatic even, but um, you have to think, that that was a good intention, because otherwise, yeah. why would you be? Yeah, I mean, except for yeah. some scholarly interest, why would you be translating it if not for edification? Sure. You know, yeah. and and then the decision becomes this sure. difficult sure. Uh, thing. I, I would, I mean, I think I would just throw if you throw the it question at me. The, the, my first answer would simply be the words on the page before me. Um, obviously, then you have to, there has to be you have to sure. be educated and sure. you have to know the language, you have to know context and all that. But sure. that seems to me the it intention. I think I think if we think about intention, we need to think about our own intentions sure. too. Sure. Um, and again, this this gets back to the point of uh, a point that I touched on perhaps about. Uh, you know, th there, are, there are many different contexts in which translations of Tibetan texts into English have been produced. Some of them are academic. Um, some of them are, uh, are intended more for an audience yes. uh, of, let's say, well-educated practitioners. And, you know, a, a, a scholar of Tibetan Buddhism may have at some level, a, a desire to help transmit yes. Tibetan Buddhism, but but probably in a college university setting, that's not the primary yes. motivation. Whereas that, I think, is the primary motivation. Uh, transmission is key uh, for uh, for for many people. Whereas in an academic setting. It's not always the same. I mean, I, having said that, I should I should admit that when I applied to the University of Wisconsin graduate program in like 1975, my essay read something like, um, "I I hope I hope to learn Tibetan and Sanskrit so that I can help spread Buddhism to the West." <laughs> I, I mean, I'm still incredulous that they Did accepted. You go in? I got in. Yeah. 
But I mean, sometimes I've, in my own translation work, um, you know, sort of, as a Tibetan, it's a slightly weird situation because in an ideal scenario, you should be translating into your own native language. <laughs> for me, it's sort of a, what um, you know, George Bellis would call kind of L2 translation. You know, I'm a sort of an L2 language 2 translation. But, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, I, I get into a situation where, you know, I question if the author himself actually knows what he's talking mm. about. <laughs> well. Um, and, and then what do you do? You I mean, can it, do that. I can't do that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, I think there, there is, I mean, and, and that's when the translation gets very interesting because still you can produce something. But if you flesh it out and make it clearer, then, I mean, is that a translation? Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is it's, it's an interesting question. And then sometimes, you know, for example, when I did the mind training book, it has around 40 texts, over a dozen authors in it. How do I make sure that all the texts don't sound the same? Because it's one person who is translating it. The texts are written by different people, yeah. and the quality of writing in Tibetan is very different. Some authors are horrible. Yeah. I mean, like in Tibetan, you, like, you read a page and you get a, oh, I've got to go back to it, you know. And some authors are brilliant. You can't stop reading. I mean, that's human. I mean, it ha happens in English writing. So, so, so doesn't you Tibetan. Get terrible translators and brilliant translators. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you do? I mean, in those kind of situations, and that's when I found out that you can never really step out of your own shadow, mm -hmm. because in the end, what you produce is really, to a large extent, your product. <laughs> so I don't know if you have struggled with those kind of multiple authors in one volume. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I, as I said, I'm on my 30th church yes, yes. liturgy, not even, you know, commentary. So it's, uh, it's really a problem. Yeah. And it's a, it's a problem to make it, it not only sounding different and reflecting it, but also just for, for the English, you know, to, to keep it. I don't know who reads these things anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to try and make it readable, readable yeah, without true. using such true. a limited vocabulary yeah. that you find. But do you try to create a rhythm in the sentence so that it could be sung? Well, because I don't know that really, people do. In Tibetan, the chur, the, yes. the, one of the unique features of yeah. chur is that you should I be able know. to sing it. I know. <laughs> it will take someone more talented okay. than, than I to do that. <laughs> Just to chime in on this, um, <clears throat> uh, the idea of making it sort of singable. Um, there are efforts uh, by, by translators. I know in, uh, there's a French translator uh, who is, tries to do that, who tries to make, not with chu in particular, but with, with verses. He tries to keep the verse structure yes. yeah. intact, but also to make it so that you can actually sing, sing it, verses. Yeah. Uh, in, oh, there's the been same. a lot of attempts at yes. that, actually. Mm. Yeah, Rob Pierce did a Lama Chopa um, version in that. Mm. But um, you know you pay a price because it doesn't read well. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, <laughs> exactly. English has too many syllables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was I was also going to to just to to say that uh, to the Jimbala, your comments on um, you know in the end you can never really step out of your own skin um, echoes quite a bit what um, something that David Bellow said of translation in the end says what the translator wants it wants to, to say. say. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I found that interesting, and also um, the idea of, you know, there's a question that came up um, while we're discussing this is, um, how do our own intentions, or how does our intention um, in translating a text affect the way we are going to understand what we consider the intention of the author of the original text? Mm -hmm. Because when, when we're translating, um, we're making all sorts of all sorts of choices. Yeah. Who are we translating for? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how we structure it. Do we, sure. you know, do, do we remain faithful, more closely faithful to the original text, or do we, you know, do we uh, decide to uh, to be particularly kind to our readers? Um, these are all things that we have to take into consideration. So I just something that came up yeah. came to mind. I mean, one thing that I find quite helpful is that. Um, you know, if I'm translating, say, for example, like uh, the, the Book of Kadam was another challenging project that I did, um, I try to, uh, as much as possible, try to get to know the individuals, the authors, the key players, mm 
because their sectarian allegiances, their commitment to a particular lineage of teaching, their personal relationships really makes a difference when you read the text. Uh, because after all, they're all human beings. You know, I mean, they have as much emotions as we do, and uh, you know, there are constraints. They are, sometimes they do certain things out of deference to their teacher, you know, and that may not be their own position. So, I, I personally find that really helpful to really kind of read as much as around the author, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when I start reading the text. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I mean, other people might have different but approaches. Does, but does that? I mean, kind of like Kay and Peel. Sure. Does, is that what they intended you to know? No, but the thing, it comes through often in tones. Yes, For example, like if they may be making a reference to a particular person's viewpoint, <coughs> their background yes, would affect the way in which, and then you can understand why there is that particular tone. And right. you want to retain that tone, tone in the English translation. Yeah. If it is reverential, mm -hmm. it is if it is dismissive, that matters. Because yeah. mm -hmm. that's an important part of the whole meaning. Yeah. And in order to get that, you need to have some larger background mm -hmm. of you know, what was happening. For example, like uh, when you look at Karampa's critique of Tsongkhapa's you know, Madhyamaka, <coughs> in the, if you don't understand that Tsongkhapa studied at Sakya, right, right. You know, then started writing original works without c citing any authoritative sources from Sakya, mm -hmm. then of course, it is, you know, some of the Sakya must think us are going to look at, look at him as like an upstart, you know, I mean, yeah. who's, who's, you know, disloyal or ungrateful. So it's very human. Then you can begin to understand, and then the tone in which these kind of statements are made needs to be retained. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that, you know, so you have to read a larger kind of... Yeah. Uh, but this, yeah. there also, when, when you think, though, about Indic materials, yeah. It, it becomes generally more problematic, yes, I true. think, because we know so little, little yeah. about uh, so many of the really vital figures in Indic tradition, certainly in dealing with Saraha, Kanha, Tilopa. Yeah. I was dealing with people who are, are That's true. we know almost nothing yeah. historically yeah. about. Um, and that, of course, it tempts one to, to just sort of make, make something sure. up. Um, and it and also with regard to the Indic materials, the whole question of how much we, I, I tried in, in Tantric Treasure simply to, as I kind of said in answer to the it question, to just read the texts before me and, and not, to, not to allow myself to be too influenced by commentaries that had been written later by uh, some Indians, mostly by Tibetans, and you know I think th this this is is an issue as well. When whether you're reading Saraha or Dharmakirti or the Abhisamaya Alankara or or whatever it, it may be, the degree to which we um, the, the, the influence that later commentarial traditions, and in our case, particularly Tibetan commentarial traditions, have on the way we present, talk about, even translate the, the Indic original. Sure. Well, great. I think maybe we can open it up to the floor for, uh, for further questions and discussion. There are two microphones. You be, feel free to... First of all, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, I really always <clears throat> appreciate the disclaimers at the beginning of texts. <laughs> so thank you for bringing it up. And I think one that, that came to my mind, I, I believe uh, George Bernard Shaw once said that the biggest um, problem with communication is the illusion that it has been accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to um, offer something that's had a lot of great deal, a great deal of kind of raw explanatory power for me. It's a theme that we've been circumambulating here that was intimated in one of the questions. And this is a, a, a contribution that comes from the West that um, I offer with some hesitation because whenever we mention things like psychology, it's almost a pejorative in a, in a group like this. But um, for me, it's really helpful to understand that for the last 100 years or so, hundreds of developmentalists have articulated levels of um, cultural intellectual development. So when a translator translates a text, obviously they're translating it through their level of development. And this has really been mm. suggested by so much of what we're talking about. And the problem with these, these levels is that they aren't things that we see, that we can't look at, we look through. 
So they are the sort of the inherent poisons that, that uh, infect what we translate. So um, again, it's, it's as if what Dr. Bilos was saying, that we bring, we have to take the responsibility of bringing meaning into the target text. So I'm wondering if, if this is just an offering, if you have any comments about that approach, that uh, kind of Western psychological approach to bringing a greater sense of humility and also understanding the blind spots that infect us, of which we have really very little awareness. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would endorse humility always. <laughs> and I apologize if it sounded pejorative to mention psychology. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a, there is a tendency to go back and psychologize some of these figures that are authors from a Western psychology point of view, like that I don't think is always, I mean, I think the psyche of different, you know, time and place people is quite different, and that there's a danger and tendency to do that. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to take a random example of kind of like Zhang Gun Control and like, oh, he was so upset because, you know, he, uh, he was, his Nyingma roots were taken away from him and he was made to become Cargue because of politics. He didn't seem that upset. I mean, I feel like that's a, you know, <laughs> he loved his teacher, Situ Rinpoche. I mean, he, you know, I think that's the kind of thing that we tend to do that we have to watch out. But going down to the other end, how can we not have the language of psychology, which we're so, uh, we're so embedded in? Um, I would, yes, it's the responsibility to give meaning but I would not say there's no meaning there already. There is already meaning there. Um, and then the job is to translate. I mean, I think it would actually be a sort of arrogance to think we're giving meaning to the, to the text. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 think, you know, I think we have to see what would maybe be an equivalent. The, ideally, what would be the equivalent reaction in a person reading it in translation than was uh, elicited in the original Tibetan, but that's very, very tricky and difficult. Yeah. I think in my own sense is um, there might be translations and translations. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of interpretation you're suggesting is, I think, another level of conceptual translation. And I don't know, I mean, I don't personally feel I, as a translator, it's my job to do that second level translation. So, uh, you know, my, for me, you know, they, in this sense, I may be more on the non-adaptive side, uh, on, on George, you know, David Bellows' kind of schema. Um, you know, one thing that I've always admired about the Tibetan translations of classical Indian texts is that they were done in such a way that the, the texts themselves are uh, flexible enough to open to different interpretations coming from different philosophical perspectives. And that I see as a richness. It's also quite hard to do. You, 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 you don't want a kind of a, a meaningless text that is quite banal and kind of, you know, devoid of any particular meaning. You want a really robust text, but at the same time, you don't want to skew the meaning of that particular text. It, from a particular perspective, say Yogacara or Madhyamagara, whatever it is, uh, or Sotrantika. So that is, this is one area where the Tibetans have been tremendously successful. If you look at, you know, Abhisama Alamkara, which, you know, the Tibetan text itself allows interpretation coming from Yogacara, you know, uh, Madhyamagara Prasangika, Madhyamagara, you know, all of this. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, Dharmakirti's text, you know, the way in which the Tibetans have done it, allows all that multiplicity of interpretation. You know, whether Dhammakirti is accept this or accept that. I mean, all of this can be supported by the... Inter and this is where I, I hope and wish that the level of English translation from Tibetan text would strive. So there is a clarity in the target language, there's a rigor, there's a robustness, but at the same time, the it would al support the multiplicity of the interpretation that the other teachers can use. So now, at that second level of translation, then someone can take an anthropological perspective and read the text. Someone can take a, a, a kind of depth psychology kind of, mm -hmm. kind of type 
Jungian type analysis and read the text. Someone can come up with a Derridean deconstructionist, a critical theory or whatever. Then that's just another level of translation. And if you do that as the first level, then all the other possible interpretations are ruled out. Mm, that's excellent. And this is, this is my, my view, yeah. Okay, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Sarah, I guess, for a little exegesis of the quotation that's been up here on the screen. Translation imports new elements which may be assimilated, but how does it restore essentials which have been forgotten in traditional literary method? Can you give some examples of that? Um, oh, examples? Or just talk about well, it in general. <laughs> that would take a little while to think of examples. I think what it indicates is that um, there's a refresh, you know, this rejuvenation or refreshment in the target language um, that can be, you can, I feel like sometime you can take that liberty that it might have become a little stale or dry, you know, in terms of more, not so much forgotten, maybe that's a little too extreme, but um, um, it could be kind of repetitive, you know, as you know, in Tibetan, it's, you know, they, freely and happily plagiarize a lot. And, um, and it gets a sort of you know, repetitive, and that by a translation that can refresh in that and for our ears and for the, the target audience, making it more, uh, um, like more accessible and maybe even having new ideas, as, as yeah. Tutin Jinpo was saying. There's, new, you know, there's different levels of meaning that could be brought out without taking away anything that could be actually presented and make it you know, more interesting, I hope. I mean, you know, I'm, I try not to go too much into vernacular, but on the other hand, it's, often, it's often kind of irresistible to have some interesting words in there some, sometime. If I were going to, me, if I was going to, you know, allow myself to go totally vernacular, I would definitely stick with the language of the 60s and 70s, <laughs> which I think is perfect for, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, your mongpa freak out or chill out. whatever, but <laughs> <laughs> chill out would be you know, gompa. But uh, I just, uh, <laughs> uh, it would be archaic already, so there's no point. <laughs> but, but I do allow it, I mean, you know, because it just gets awfully dull, I have to say. You know, I want the reader to at least, at least not give up or, you know, fall asleep. <laughs> It reminds, I mean, what, what you're talking about reminds me a little bit of debates that I know kicked around for some time among translators of the Pali Canon, which of course is famous for its repetitiveness. And I think, you know, we're all aware that most modern translators have chosen to use a lot of ellipses yeah. uh, for, for what in, in the original is, is indeed a, a great deal of repetition. But those who have argued against that approach and I don't think they get published all that often, um, are, are those are, who say that, remember, these were memorized texts, these texts had ritual functions, and if you, if you simply use ellipses and don't get that, the, the power of the repetitiveness. I mean, th think about, if, you, if you think about something like a, uh, I don't know, a Christian hymn or some biblical passage that has these, these tremendously powerful repetitions to them, and, and we know in, in our cultural context that the power comes in part from the repetition, and yet we, we think, oh, we don't have the time for this when we're looking at, at a similar example in another culture. Um, I, I don't know whether the Tibetan instance fits quite the same way, but it, yeah. what you said reminded me of that. Yeah. I don't know if that answered me close enough. <laughs> One question. Is it on? No. Da Whoa. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> to ask my question, I have to look, give a little bit of background. I'm pretty much strictly an oral interpreter. I've been translating for one Kempo for 12 years, and he has three Kempo degrees from Sertar, Kempo Jigme Punzok Rinpoche's monastery in Tibet, Pina Rinpoche's monastery in southern India, and also um, Katok in Kham. Mm -hmm. And um, the question I have is about is the responsibility of the text to the oral lineage oh. on the... <laughs> yeah, I know what you're going to I am always struggling because yeah. most often when I take these texts, especially... Um,
something that's quite academic, like Umalajupa, I'm not even going to try to say it in Tibet or Sanskrit, <laughs> or Umatsawi Sherab, uh, or Nyeshe Drunme, and so forth. When I take a translation from uh, someone and am translating the oral teachings on that, they are quite distant from each other. <laughs> and I have a, a, is it my responsibility as the oral interpreter to bridge that gap, or should the translators that are translating the written works also base that on the oral transmission? Well, you're the voice, so mm -hmm. you're um, <laughs> 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 um, Yeah, I mean, this is actually quite tricky. For example, like, um, I, mean, I only interpret for His Holiness, so, um, and, you know, in my case, I have the advantage of the teacher being someone whose command of English is very good, so I cannot stray too far <laughs> <laughs> because he catches me. Um, <laughs> but what I do notice is that, for example, if he's giving a commentary on a text, um, if possible, I try to bring my own translation. Um, and uh, because, you know, you can never step out of your own skin, and uh, Lama is commenting and pointing to a particular line and a stanza, and you have to repeat that. And if you repeat from an existing translation and you don't agree with the vocabulary or even the understanding that is presented there, then you're kind of stuck. So, uh, and often I end up, if I haven't had the time to do this particular text myself, then I end up kind of self-correcting right there on the spot. Uh, so I will be reading and then sometimes the, the audience members who are more perceptive will say, my goodness, you're reading from another text. I mean, we all have the same program, but I'm kind of, you know, automatically yeah. editing as I read uh, so that I can interpret, you know, the, the, in His Holiness's teaching. So I think it's, um, I wouldn't go too so far as to suggest that the textual translation should be done in such a way that it really respects the oral tradition. That I think will be going too far. In fact, the oral tradition of these teachings are really based upon the existence of a text. You know, you do have sometimes sindhis, which are written down, notes taken at teachings, where the written text comes after, you know, it's the, where the oral tradition is the priority. But most of the texts are actually originally written as a text, and then the oral commentarial traditions evolved on the basis of that. So if anything, the written text has to take priority. That's, that's my view, yeah. Um, on, on this matter of uh, repetition, uh, prosodic beauty in a lot of Tibetan texts involves using the same word or homonyms as many times as you can in a stanza. And it's very beautiful in Tibetan. If you do that in English, it's just mm -mm. awful. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, the, the readers won't put up with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know what to do with that problem. <laughs> I, I think many of us have stopped trying to be consistent, <laughs> actually, you know, allowing ourselves not to translate the same word the same way every time. Yeah. I mean, it just is too awful. Yeah. So that's but, one part. Well, I mean, it is, mm. to be fair, I mean, the, the, one of the dis difference between Tibetan and English is that English has a far larger vocabulary. Yes, it does. Yes, I mean, very more. Just look at the dictionary. Yeah. I mean, that's... It, you look at OED and you look at, uh, you know, Tibetan dictionary. <laughs> so Tibetans generally tend to be much more contextual. Same word could mm -hmm. mean differently in different contexts. Yes. So in those situations, it makes no sense to right. offer the same English yeah. term every time it comes up. And yeah. even when it means the same, we have many words yeah, that mean the true. same thing. Yeah. And it just adds flavor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't agree. I don't agree entirely because, I, I, at least when if we're talking about poetry, again, I, I think that the a, 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 you know Tibetan poem where there's a deliberate repetition yeah, yeah, yeah. of the word the, numerous yeah. times, uh, yeah. that that has force, and and I think it needs to be respected. And I, I was going to comment before that uh, when you when you talked about hoping that we could, we could find a, a level of English translation that somehow respected the subtlety of these yeah. terms and yet was in English. Um, uh, my response is, well, I, I'm not the one who's going to achieve that, but, but there are still footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. yeah. um, you've been talking about, somebody mentioned uh, the importance of intention, intentionality. 
So I wanted to uh, um, raise the question of the reception of translation. Um, to go back to what David Bellis was saying this morning, you know, there was quite an ill-tempered exchange between um, Jerem and Augustine on the um, translation of the Vulgate. Uh, Jerem was correcting the already existing Latin translations in the light of what he called the, the Veritas Hebraica, the Hebrew truth, that the Old Testament translation should be based on the Hebrew. But when uh, this, uh, when the new translation was read in certain churches in North Africa, uh, the people noticed that they, what, what he was saying was not what they were used to. Mm. And it caused a riot. <laughs> and uh, Augustine had his own reasons for saying that actually the older translations were preferable because they were closer to the Septuagint, which was the text that the apostles had given to the church. And then if you jump ahead to the translation of the Bible in the 16th century, uh, Tyndale produced a new translation into English in which he retranslated, or rather translated certain key terms in his own way. And as you may know, there was a furious uh, um, controversy between him and Thomas More. And Thomas More was saying he was falsifying the meaning of the scriptures by using new and strange translations. So there was a, a heretical translation and an orthodox translation, and the heretical translation was burned as much as it could be burned, and eventually Tyndale himself was burned. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, my point is that the, whether one judges the quality or the value of this translation or that really depends on criteria that are not found in the texts themselves. So I was very interested when you mentioned this case of Jerem Boucher, who preferred another translation. Uh, and I was wondering, actually, what, on what criteria did he prefer it? Because obviously, it's not something that he could find in the translation. And as far as I know, he didn't know Sanskrit. No. He must have had other, another agenda for saying that this translation was better than the other. Yes. I think um, quite often he would use a kind of a, a certain assumption of a coherence in the overall position of the text. And, uh, and then we'll, he will be comparing to uh, Chantakirti's own auto-commentary of that particular section. So it's a sort of a much more cumulative kind of criteria. But large part of that is really a, a certain supposition of a certain coherence of the overall position. Uh, and then some of them also has to do with the way in which the grammatical particles, uh, you know, the, the way in which the Sanskrit words are chopped and translated into Tibetan makes a difference. And those kind of, I mean, you know, um, the one thing that we have to understand is that although that many of the Tibetans did not know Sanskrit in a, in a real sense, but it was expected that any scholar worth of his salt was expected to have studied Da which is basically Sanskrit linguistics. And you have to master the basic Samdhi rules and some other kind of, you know, uh, um, um, uh, ethics rules, the way in which ethics modify. Those, any mm -hmm. scholar worth his soul was expected to study Da. So or, someone like Jirmbuche <laughs> would be familiar with Da. So that gives them some understanding of how the Samdhi rules and the the Tibetan translation might have chopped the word in a different way. So that's another consideration they bring in. For example, like Jameng Shepa, he, the, he brings up a lot of those considerations in his reading um, of a particular translation. So you're right, it's not in the text. You have to bring it from outside, yeah. Can I add one thing really quick? I just, I think that's a, such a good example of translations taking on their own life as soon as they're... Yeah. Printed and, you, and, and in a way, we're all kind of stuck with some of these old yes. t English and French translations, and it doesn't help to change them because people are already quite used sure. to them, even sure. when they're sure. it's like out of con sure. it's out, out of the box. Yes. The cat. Yeah, there was a similar <clears throat> situation in China where, in in many cases, the earlier translations were less faithful in some sense to the. Uh, the Indic originals, but uh, and and later people like Xuanzang came along and you know did very precise ones, but uh, the Chinese in general preferred the earlier ones. Mm -hmm. yeah.
I guess my question is about the physical book that we produce. And we've been talking a lot about how the words on the page are the what the translator decides it to be. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how that should be represented on the book in terms of the placement of the translator and the original author's names. Um, and I, I think of two very different examples. So if we go downstairs, we look at a lot of these books, the translator is listed right there on the cover. And then if I go to the bookstore and I pick up a copy of 100 Years of Solitude, I can be looking at three different copies, and I have sure. to hunt right. through it to find out who translated who. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of us in this room have favorite translators, right? We, I've been known to buy books because I like the translator's work, and so I think I'll like this one. And so the, the question is sort of, how should the translator be represented on this sort of physical object vis-a-vis mm. -vis the author? Very good question. <laughs> really. um, and, um, I think that maybe I don't, I don't want to you know, kind of take over it. So you, you want to say something? Well, I, I can only say it yeah. reminds me of my background. My mother was a screenwriter. Uh, and if mm. you've ever gotten involved, which I have, unfortunately, in you know, as her heir of um, the leg legalities of Hollywood and, you know, whose name goes where and how much, it, you know, how much is a bar borrowing from somebody and how much is it original and how much, it could get very, 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 very complicated. And, you know, Writers Guild has sued people on my behalf even though I didn't want to because my mother's name was like over here instead of over there. And it's, uh, we don't want to go that far. <laughs> so I'm just, I don't want to go there. <laughs> you take it. I think um, um, in our classic series, um, I, can, I can speak from my own personal experience. Um, that was an important consideration because uh, one of the, the primary intention behind the whole classic series is to really bring up the profile of these great Tibetan masters and authors. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, we debated a lot about whether the translator's name should be on the cover at all. Um, mm. We did end up having it, but we have it in a smaller font. The author is in a larger font, and the translator is in a smaller font. But then we run into problems like, um, you know, the Lojong Gyata, it's an anthology. Um, mm. There is no author. Then, um, and then we did the Mahamudra collection, mm -hmm. which uh, Peter Allen Roberts, he's here actually, he did a brilliant job. Um, although it took a while, but. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but um, there, because it's a collection of texts that Tangurum produced, uh, you know, compiled, and uh, at my request. So we put uh, the compiler's name and the translator's name. So. I think it's you have to make a decision. I mean, I for the literary um, things. I mean, I read a lot of um, you know uh, translations from uh, into English. Like my favorite authors are really non non native English authors. Like that I tend to read a lot of Russian novels or um, and translators make a difference. I always go for the Penguin edition because <laughs> I trust the Penguins to produce really very good readable translations. So and they're cheap. <laughs> Cheaper. <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, especially uh, uh, the point you made that the priority should be first the written text and then the oral tradition, which I totally understand. But practically, isn't it often so that? The root texts especially are very cryptic and are not understandable without the sure. living tradition. Sure. And then in this case, you have to make a choice because sure. the, the commentaries are going sure. in yeah. very different sure. directions. Sure. I think it depends really on the purpose. For uh, practitioners, I think the oral teachings really matter because practitioners are in the context of a community. There's a relationship with the teacher relationship with a particular lineage that has a whole history behind it. So it's a living, you know, the teaching is being engaged with as a, as a, as a living, you know, almost like a living organism. So there, I think, um, text takes a secondary position because texts are m more like when you need to consult something, when you need to verify something, it's like a kind of a resource. But the oral tradition, the oral teachings really has a much more primary role.
But I was thinking here more in terms of the relationship to the actual text. Um, you know, the question was asked whether the text should be modified in order to suit the oral teachings. And this is where I was saying that if the t text is a sindri, then it is an oral teaching that has been written down as a note, uh, which has a, a you know, completely different flavor because it's closer to vernacular, it's more fluid, it's more flexible. But if the text is originally written as a treatise, as a separate standalone text, then <coughs> trying to adjust the translation to suit a particular teacher's oral teaching, I think is probably, um, in the long run, not, you know, uh, not very uh, helpful, because it precludes the possibility of this text supporting mm -hmm. the oral commentary of another, another lama or another tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do have the yeah. irony nowadays as well that so many oral teachings have been written down yes. and are published. I mean, most of His Holiness's books sure. are, in sure. fact, sure. transcriptions and sure. reworkings and editings sure. of, of various oral teachings. Sure. So the line between the yes, oral true. and the written true. is, is getting blurred true. In, in certain respects. True. Well, transcriptions are a whole nother problem that we don't yeah. have time to. <laughs> Well, um, thank you all very much. Thank you for thank you. the discussion. Thank you for your questions. And I'll pass it over to Marcus, who has some.